This is a photo I took of a bullfighting poster promoting a, a bullfight in Mexico. And this is my grandfather, Douglas Henderson. And so I have always respected the culture and the people of Mexico. My grandfather went there as a professional wrestler. And the most famous bullfighters in the world who are wrestling fans came to see him wrestle and introduced themselves after. And he persuaded them to show him how to be a bullfighter. And so he fought six professional fights. And this is a photo from one of the posters in one of those uh, fights. He was referred to in those posters as the greatest North American bullfighter since Ernest Hemingway, to whom he bears a great uh, resemblance. So that's another Independence Party first. He went back to professional wrestling, and I believe he was the world medal weight title holder out of Chicago, and he came here and organized the first professional wrestling in Minnesota, which he uh, showed in Anoka, Minnesota. Hi, I'm Steve Carlson, and today I want to lay out my positive, constructive positions on immigration and the Mexican border. I've moved this issue up because it has been highlighted by recent comments by Keith Ellison and Mark Dayton. I am well able and bring experience and a track record to this issue and to each position I take on the most critical issues of the 2014 congressional elections, in which I ask for your vote on August 12th, Independence Day in Minnesota, in the Independence Party primary. The specific issue area I want to set out today is immigration and the Mexican border. There are other immigration issues on the table, but they mostly downgrade the importance of this huge Mexican border issue, which we must attend to because of our expansion into the Southwest as a nation in the 19th century and our Mexican-American War, which created this border in the 19th century. Bringing this issue to you through the social media is part of my commitment to take money out of election politics and to engage you in decisions of voting, but also in shaping policy. And I'm committed to making the Senate work on this issue, and it is not working. The Senate has oversimplified and distorted this issue for political reasons, and it needs to be understood on its own terms. I ask you to keep an open mind as you listen to these facts and to reach conclusions on the immigration issue with an eye to our future as a nation and what is best. In the right relations between our two countries, Mexico and the United States, including faithfully adhering to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo as ratified, we benefit tremendously from our good neighbor relationship. However, many people are suffering who are immigrants and are not treated right or who are Americans, who are subject to the chaos and peril of some of the intrusions across the border. So we need to do better. It is a problem that can be solved, and I'll show you how. And unless you, as the voters, solve the problems of big money in politics and a stymied partisan U.S. Senate, these elections will remain a kind of circus merry-go-round, basically meaningless smoke and mirrors. Solutions are possible, and I'll show you how. As the nominee of the Independence Party for the U.S. House of Representatives in 2010, I kicked off my campaign with an address on immigration and posted my five-point plan for an international border zone encompassing both sides of the border and involving the border states' organizations, including the United States of Mexico and the United States of America. The plan calls for security and human rights on both sides of the border reducing the crisis and presenting opportunity, kind of like when the United States of America was first born. Recent events, including the approach of the Obama administration and Senate Democrats to re immigration reform, have only served to heighten the viability and appropriateness of my five-point plan. The border is located in the region of northern Mexico, a part of Mexico that had not generally been included in the effective jurisdiction of the Mexican government in Mexico City, which has always been the largest city in the American hemisphere. Uh, that's bigger than Los Angeles, New York, Chicago. And that region has always been neglected by Mexico economically. And it has always been a kind of frontier, or as the word for border in Spanish, frontera. And my plan is very simply 
to develop that region in cross-border cooperation with the Mexican states and the U.S. states bordering Mexico, from California to Texas. And as the basis for this, for both countries to extensively coordinate and cooperate in securing safety and human rights in what would be informally treated as an international border zone. The key here is to create a binational zone that is safe and secure, in which sensible businesses would find a stable environment to create jobs, jobs for Americans and jobs for Mexican nationals. And in the latest humanitarian crisis, which has been created by poor democratic leadership on immigration and manipulation of the issue to seek to garner votes on grounds of race, ethnicity, and nationality, jobs could be created in the zone for those who now feel compelled to surge across the border and basically throw themselves at the mercy of the American Border Patrol. Such an enterprise zone might give both Mexico and the United States greater tools to regulate the flow from those seeking refuge, but it might also enable greater job creation in their own countries. The viability of such a plan is shown by the fact that trade between the U.S. and Mexico is about a billion dollars a day. And I think that's more because that's a 2010 figure. And that is with a border that is not only chaotic and dangerous to Americans, but which is a perennial political football, as immigrants are wrongly blamed during economic downturns. I say wrongly in this sense, that we greatly benefit from the con contributions of Mexican immigrants, legal or illegal, those that take difficult jobs, especially in agriculture, and support their families, and have powerful family bonds and values. And so we attract illegal as well as legal immigrants to fill important jobs in the United States. The plan is based on normalization of relations under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which created the border. Usually that treaty is not discussed, except for those whose Mexican government land grants were not agreed to by the U.S. Senate in ratifying the treaty, and so they lost their land. But it is important because it gave cultural rights to those former Mexican citizens who chose to remain in the United States one year after the treaty went into effect, and they were to become full American citizens, even though they retained their Mexican language and culture. And that has never really been achieved, and we should allow this culture and language its due. To be clear, these are not people or were not people, since they are the ancestors of generations here today, who came across the border and refused to learn English. These were people who were already here. And by the way, it was from them that the first Declaration of Independence from Mexico came, not from the American state of Texas. And this first precipitated the Mexican-American War that created the border and gave to the United States the American Southwest. And that declaration was made in Spanish, and they are Americans, Spanish-speaking Americans, if they stayed north of the border following the treaty's ratification. So that should have been a bilingual region of the United States all along by our treaty. And that is why you'll hear me say that the treaty was actually a higher law that all our states in that territory should follow, should have followed. My proposal for an international border zone to strengthen both security and human rights while creating jobs on both sides of the border and recognizing language and cultural rights for the Spanish speaking would achieve solutions to the problems we face now. Recently, Keith Ellison, who serves as the U.S. representative from the 5th Congressional District, has made a proposal for Minnesota to respond to the latest border crisis, which involves migrants from other Central American countries. Ellison is said to be a leader on immigration, but I have not seen it, and his proposal is a kind of symbolism to support Obama's position on this latest crisis. Naturally, it would make matters far, far worse if Democrats all over America would begin to resettle this particular stream, hoping they could increase their Hispanic votes in future elections. I have studied this law, this Wilberforce Act, and it is being abused and the real purposes of the law are not being achieved, and they should be. As far as the treatment of this flow of young people from Central America, who are not obviously part of the population described in the Wilberforce Act, because they are too many, and the Act instructs the administration to protect people against severe trafficking in persons. 
This is an international humanitarian crisis and should be treated as such. The UN Commissioner on High, uh, High Commissioner on Refugees should be included, uh, but it should not be treated as a border problem. If we treated this as a border problem, then populations from every part of the world in turmoil could be treated by American law as immigrants under the trafficking provisions. And the trafficking provisions could never work. And severe forms of trafficking, including slavery, peonage, trafficking in persons, sexual assault, and commercial sex industry, extortion, blackmail, and worker exploitation in the United States would actually increase. Do you want that? I think no. So we need to force the U.S. Senate and the Obama administration to focus on the reality, to preserve intact this Wilberforce Act, but not to allow this recent migration to cause the United States to abuse the protections provided by this law. If we would develop an international border zone, we could have more stability and human rights there, and this wouldn't happen. It's happening in a vacuum created through a lack of leadership. Current law says, this is the Wilberforce Act, Quote, if a federal law enforcement official files an application stating that an alien is a victim of a severe form of trafficking and may be a potential witness to such trafficking, the Secretary of Homeland Security may permit the alien to remain in the United States to facilitate the investigation and prosecution of those responsible for such crime, unquote. And we're talking about a period of four years, which may be extended. The potential for abuse of this is obvious. So the question is, who are these federal law enforcement officials and how are they making this determination? Because none of these stays of removal, as they are called, are allowed until that law enforcement official states the migrant is a victim of a severe form of trafficking, uh, slavery, peonage, trafficking in persons, sexual assault, extortion, blackmail, and worker exploitation in the United States. And the press has again distorted the truth in order to help Obama's claims that his hands are tied. And to Senator Al Franken, I'm not lying. By saying there are some broad provisions where any unaccompanied children are involved. Well, and Nancy Pelosi goes on in, in comments that urging such a supposedly blanket treatment are in derogation and those comments are in derogation of the federal law, which reads, quote, Upon receiving credible information that a child described in subparagraph C2I, who is seeking assistance under this paragraph, may have been subjected to a severe form of trafficking in persons, the Secretary of Health and Human Services shall promptly determine if the child is eligible for interim assistance under this paragraph, unquote. Again, a certain child, not all children, and credible information that this certain child may have been subjected to a severe form of trafficking in persons, slavery, peonage, sexual assault, extortion, blackmail, and worker exploitation in the United States. The underlying purpose of this Wilberforce Act is to keep the international border zone safe. It requires the Attorney General to report to Congress the number of persons who have been charged or convicted under one of, or more of Sections 1581, 1583, 1584, 1589, 1590, 1591, 1592, or 1594 of Title 18 of the U.S. Code. That is the criminal code of the federal government during the preceding fiscal year and the sentences imposed against each such person. I've heard nothing in the press about this or from Attorney General Holder, only that Wilberforce should be a shield to allow Obama to manipulate the border. To the extent that Democrats are playing with this border situation to put pressure on Republicans to cave to Democrat efforts for a blanket amnesty in exchange for Democrat votes in elections, they have to cease and desist. I have shown a way to achieve the kind of good neighbor relationships, including normalized immigration, but also creating jobs on both sides of the border, driving industry, and creating capability for security and human rights. So I've begun to lay out my positive, constructive positions on 2014 issues that are important to you in this video. As I've already said, I believe I am well able and bring experience and a track record to each position I take. 
on the most critical issues of the 2014 congressional elections. And there will be some hot ones. Now I know when we turn to a campaign or governance issue, it feels like it is the most important issue of all. And that is as it should be. Each issue should be attended to with the utmost care and detail and responsibility. But in this primary election, we have to be selective. We can't ignore any of these issues, and they build on each other. So if one is listed after the others, it benefits from what has been said before. And I hope as you see my positions on the issues that concern you the most, you will see that I care about the same things you do, and put forward ideas and solutions that can be attained in the United States Senate. I will work with you to achieve them. Here are the issues I will address, each in a separate video, but also seeing each as part of a whole plan for Congress. And I want to add that I will not treat men's issues and women's issues, race issues, or Democrat, Republican, or even Tea Party issues, because our goal in the Constitution is to have one America. We cannot take that for granted. We are on a road to that achievement, only we are in a ditch. Here are the issues I seek to convey to you in this short time. I hope that you will agree we need to campaign online for various reasons, but first and foremost to reach everybody possible while taking the money out of politics. I have chosen to use targeted Twitter postings, included, including YouTube videos, using an approach which appears to be unique. I also post these at my website, Steve Carlson for Congress 2010.com. I hope you will feel this is appropriate and useful, and perhaps it is one channel we can all use in future elections. And I hope you'll share these with your friends and family or associates. Day one, leadership. Day two, constitutional rights, which I've already provided the first part of. Uh, there will be an additional video. Day three, independent voters dream. Day four, jobs and the economy. Day five, health care. Day 6, Immigration and Humanitarian Concerns and the Mexican Border, which I've moved up because of statements by Ellison and Dayton. Day 7, Education. Day 8, Taxes and National Debt. Day 9, Foreign Policy. Day 10, Environment. Again, the sequence of these issues doesn't reflect low priorities for the final days. Instead, those at the end will benefit from greater attention as the primary elections day approaches. That's August 12th, Independence Day in Minnesota. I thank you for viewing this. I'm Steve Carlson, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate in that primary.